Hello, good evening. Welcome back to another episode of Elephant in the Room. It is Friday the 20th. Oh, sorry, it's Thursday, not Friday Thursday. yet. Thursday. <laughs> Thursday. We're the running ahead. Thursday. Uh, right. It's our 29th episode. Tomorrow is 30th. So welcome back uh, to all. Uh, today we have another very exciting show here. Um, maybe um, you have something to say to the audience? Of course. Of course. Uh, first of all, it is Thursday and it is the 29th episode. I know Muihan is very excited because we are hitting our 30th episode tomorrow. And what an achievement and a milestone that is. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. But uh, coming back to reality, yes. it's um, This week, we have been talking to um, uh, graduates uh, who have graduated from the, from the universities and they have now started to go into the workforce. They're young, young individuals, young professionals. And the idea is to now start to focus on what are some of the issues that they are facing given the current uh, COVID-19 and the MCO that is playing out. Yesterday, we had the absolute delight of having Farhana, uh, Farah rather, Farah on board. Uh, and Farah uh, comes in from, uh, uh, from the reality and uh, a property maintenance and management field. Um, and she asked some very pertinent questions. So for those of you who have missed out, feel free, go down to our YouTube channel, go check out yesterday's, and it's all itemized in that fashion. And what I was very impressed with is the fact that a lot of our viewers were offering suggestions and thoughts and advice. And given the fact that they come to the table with such wisdom, you can't go wrong. Um, and uh, for all intents and purposes today, we are moving along and we are now talking about the same fears, the same trials and tribulations, if any, that a young social entrepreneur is now facing. And we have the absolute delight of having uh, Shai Kid, Wong Shai Kid with us. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to you, Muihan. Cool. So thank you for that. Uh, yes, and uh, for those who have just joined us, welcome. Uh, nice to see all of you. And uh, today we have a very interesting uh, guest uh, because uh, let me just pull the slide out to introduce him quickly. Okay. So uh, with us, as mentioned by Taranjit, today we have uh, Wong Shai Ki uh, to join us and uh, we all call him Shai and I think that's his uh, nickname. Uh, so when I first met Shai, uh, it was a few years ago, I think easily uh, less than three years ago, uh, when he was still a final year student. Uh, he's an engineering student in my alumni, uh, UPM. Uh, and how we met was uh, he was he and his uh, teammates was part of a, a competition uh, called the Hot Prize. So the Hot Prize is something uh, quite prestigious because they run uh, over 1,300 campuses throughout the world. And uh, they have a campus competition going to the regionals. And I was the judge in that competition uh, where his team uh, won uh, the, the campus competition. And as a result of that, uh, because of the VC's uh, request, I actually helped out uh, to prepare them for the regionals. Uh, and uh, that's how I got to know Shai much better. But since then, uh, I always uh, joke to say that uh, Shai has fly. You know, he really flew with that sense uh, uh, because uh, his team uh, really took off, uh, maybe just wanted to share some background of what he has been doing. Uh, so Luminary, which is his organization, of, uh, it was recognized as the top three impact uh, driven enterprise uh, in the idea of what is known as impact driven enterprise accreditation under the accelerator program by Malaysia Global Innovation Creativity Center or MAGIC for short, right? They were also the first runner-up for the start upper of the year uh, in Malaysia by, by total. And as well, uh, Shai is also very passionate in uh, social enterprise. So not only Luminary, he is also the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of Nation Building School, uh, which is an NGO that builds a generation of uh, civic warriors in Malaysia through personal and professional development as well as civic engagement. He is also the co-director of Social Project, uh, which is a pro bono consulting organization for the third sector. So with that, uh, would you kindly uh, help me to welcome Shai to Elephant in the Room. Hi, Shai. Hello, welcome. guys. Welcome, welcome. Really welcome. excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my and I look a bit different from the picture because you know COVID happening, right? My hair is a bit long right now. 
so yeah <laughs> just just ignore the difference for now <laughs> it, it it helps it helps when we have no hair <laughs> oh, oh gosh <laughs> yeah you're right. and, have no hair. And, you're right. and and i'm quite okay with it okay let's let's start this off shy uh, so first of all welcome to elephant in the room um and uh, Muihan mentioned the third sector. Now, that's rather intriguing. There are lots of us, me included, uh, who may not be aware of what this third sector is. So if you could very quickly talk to us, what is this third sector and what is this all about? All right. So third sector is kind of like a term that we always throw around when we are in the social impact scene. So it involves things like whether it's NGO, NPO, or even social enterprises um, within this uh, segment itself. So they use third sector because we normally known like for first sector, it means like, um, you know, state level or government level kind of organization. Um, second sector, which is more towards the market itself, which is like companies and so on. So the third sector is like in between that, whether, you know, it's mainly it's actually focused on the social impact sec uh, uh, like segment of it. So uh, a very quick one also, what is social enterprise, right? In case someone is like wondering whether they are like NGO or whether they are a company, right? So um, social enterprise is actually kind of like the, middle or the hybrid between uh, NGO and also a company, meaning that you're running a business with a social impact element integrated with it, meaning that the more business you do, the more impact you're making for the underserved communities, for example. So yeah, that's practically a bit of the third sector and social enterprise in general. Very nice. And how long have you been running this, uh, Shai? So um, the idea of social entrepreneurship kind of like came to me when I was about third year, I think about the end of third year. So it's been almost, I think, about like three years uh, of me okay. being involved in the scene. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And, and we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the challenges that you're facing a little bit further on in the program. But uh, with that in mind, uh, where do you now see, given the COVID environment that we're going through, uh, I would imagine you're playing in the tech space, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a lot about. So if you could just give us some intro or a description about what exactly are we doing? in this area, Shai? Mm, so uh, it's more towards like social entrepreneurship or is it tech scene in Malaysia tech. or? Yes, yeah. no, the, the whole, the, the, the stuff that you're doing now within mm. the social entrepreneurship, I remember you mentioned that you're providing the underserved. Yes. Uh, but what are you providing the underserved about? What is it that you're giving to them? All right, so um, Luminary uh, in general, what we are trying to do is that um, we do want to design and innovate a device that can provide clean drinkable water for the rural communities, especially towards the Orang Asli communities in Malaysia. So um, one of the reasons being is that, you know, we do see a lot of um, social initiatives trying to bring in um, technology or bring in, you know, uh, devices like solar panels towards the um, indigenous communities, for example, in rural area. But a lot of cases, this technology they bring in may not be sustainable. Um, because, you know, maybe there needs to be maintenance where the local communities might not have the technical expertise. So um, since I'm from the engineering background and I'm very much involved in the social impact scene, right? So I was wondering, like, how do I integrate these two ideas, these two passions into one? Hence, you know, Luminary was born. So the whole idea is that how do I make something which is ha like very much user friendly, um, doesn't need much technical expertise, yet is very long term sustainable in the rural area itself. So that's why there's something that I'm designing. Um, very, very proud to say that um, we actually have just finished our like third prototype, and we are working towards our MVP, minimal viable product. So yeah, uh, the progress is pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Okay, very wonderful. So uh, I think that is something that uh, helps a lot of us to really understand what is social entrepreneurship, uh, as well as to give a context that you come from that. Uh, so maybe before we proceed, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge some of our audience. Uh, so a very good shout out to Call from India, uh, from Ipoh, India Block. Ipoh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Dr. Heng, uh, all the way from Singapore, welcome back. Uh, Ted, my good brother, Ted Moy, uh, who say he is also a UPM engineering Ooh. alumni. Uh, so you alumni. Yes. Uh, and also we have uh, Chong Su Lim, also my good friend, okay. Hi, and as well as uh, Zorab. Huh? So Zorab is here as well. Thank you all for tuning in. So uh, maybe on that aspect and that focus, uh, Shai, maybe just to understand uh, your current realities and where, what has Luminary done uh, since I last saw you, I think, <laughs> quite some time. Uh, yeah. I saw you recently, sorry. Uh, but was yes. 
for a different purpose. But uh, since I last saw your progress uh, yeah, when it was conceptualizing Luminary, uh, what have you done and uh, which communities have you maybe generically tell? I know there's some sensitivity to that. Uh, maybe you share with the audience on that. Yep. So um, since last time, actually, um, I think it's about a couple of years ago uh, when I met uh, Muihan, right? So um, before that, we did go into the community um, trying to validate, you know, there's actually there's a need for this or not, whether there's a need for uh, devices like this or not. And then we did validate that, you know, there's actually a need for it. So uh, ultimately, what we did was that um, along the way, we joined in things like Accelerator Program to really develop the startup as a whole. And on the technical side also, um, what I actually what I'm doing now also, other than, you know, running Luminary as a whole, I'm also actually a postgraduate student. So what I did there was that um, I'm developing this technology um, for you know Luminary as a whole. Uh, but at the same time, I was thinking like, why not convert this into like a um, postgraduate research studies in under engineering? Um, then I did that, and that's kind of like a one stone two bird kind of situation that you know you can at the same time pursue your postgrad studies. At the same time, you can actually gain access to the expertise and support. At the same time, you're also developing the startup as a whole. So it's actually like one stone, three words right now, right? So yeah, so that's one of the things that I pursued. And right now, uh, as I mentioned, we are on our third prototype. Um, we are in the process of um, optimizing the whole process, um, trying to reach to our MVP. Um, now we have our proof of concept done, meaning that the mechanism that we're using is proven to be working. But how do we increase the output? How do we increase the number of water? So and in between that also, we have also um, try to push further and saying that, hey, is that really a need or not in different areas? That's why, you know, I did join in certain organization and volunteer in different form and able to actually uh, go into the RRC communities to actually run like needs assessment with them saying that, you know, do you have uh, any need? Uh, do you really need this? And what's the condition like assessing it and then ultimately see whether our technology works or not? So very proud to say that along the validation happening, right? So most of them actually further validated that's a need for it. And yeah, that's that's why, you know, it got me further wanting to do more about it. Yeah. Cool, cool. So maybe just to just to maybe have a quick discussion with you. Uh, mm -hmm. and you can also throw back question to me and Paraji yep. as well as to our audience. Uh, feel yep. free to we got a wonderful bunch of audience there, really, really uh, eager to give their uh, the support and as well as their perspective as well. So what would be one of the few key challenges that you find, uh, especially in your pursuit of uh, trying to come up with uh, both the technology as well as uh, meeting the community? Uh, what are the things that maybe you can help us to understand better in your context? And probably there are certain things that probably you may want to tap our brains to, 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 to further help you in any way. Uh, mm. Please also say that out so that we can also then look at it together, right? So yes, maybe what, what are the challenges first you, you can share? Yeah, so I think along the way, uh, let's talk about things like even before COVID-19, right? What are the challenges that face? So I think um, especially when you're working with the underserved communities, um, the accessibility itself is actually one of the huge challenge. For example, if you were to wanting to, you know, go into a certain village of Orasi communities, um, things like, you know, the approval or whether you have access to information towards it or not, a lot of times, um, you know, the process is very lengthy or sometimes it's lengthy, yet there's no definite answer at the end. Meaning that, you know, you might run around and then after like several months and then the replies you get is that, you know, oh, you can't go here and there's no information we can provide for you. Or maybe uh, the information provider is very focused on one segment and not really on the whole situation. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, stakeholders involved in this scene. and. Since it's also something very sensitive, touching the underserved community, right? That's why you know there could be possibility of um, issues like this. Um, so one of the things is that definitely need to work and collaborate with some organizations or social enterprises which are very much um, well established, so that we you know we can have access to uh, things that we need together. And then you know how do we help each other out in this sense? Um, I think other than that challenge, another challenge that I think. A lot of times when a lot of my you know youths asking me about my journey one of the things that i always share is that you know how youth youth power is something that's very you know very sexy in a way a lot of people talk about youth power youth is the next generation and a lot of people just you know complimenting the idea of youth but from my journey at least from my perspective one of the things i realized is that um acknowledging you and then telling that how good your journey is and you know, how good you're going on this initiative is all there 
But when it comes to times when, you know, maybe they need to put in money, uh, maybe they need to put in things like investment and so on, um, that's where suddenly youth can, can become a burden in a way. So it's, it's like, you know, I came across people saying that, you know, I heard your pitch, the idea is great, I love it, but I'm not sure whether you have the experience or, you know, whether you have the, you know, the engagement enough of it or you have the, um, you know, credibility to do it. So a lot of times it also ties back to you. So I think that's a reality we do have to acknowledge and a reality that, you know, is, it means that for youths, we actually might have to run an extra mile to get that. You can get attraction, but in order to get real um, things going on, perhaps you need to run an extra mile compared to others. Um, so at least I think that's generally the challenge that uh, I have so far. Good yeah. point. Good point. And I, I think that's uh, that's prevalent uh, simply because of the freshness that you bring to the table. And there's yeah. a level of uh, that that freshness and youngness. And and I, I like I like Zorab's point. And perhaps Muihan, you could put you could uh, raise that. You know, it's very noble and inspiring. Okay. A social enterprise. Uh, happy Thank to you. see a sustainable development thinking. And this is exactly what I think you're referring to. So, so you know, it's great. People are commenting, um, but let me take um, uh, Muihan's uh, thought one step further. You talked about the challenges. Are there any obstacles that you have faced in this regard? Mm. Obstacles. Um, I think generally, um, a lot of people claim, you know, maybe capital is the biggest obstacle for most of the startups or social enterprises, um, especially in the sense where when you go to things like investor and so on, right? Typically, when they look at your business, one of the first thing they look at is ROI. But if you're talking about things like, you know, the ROI is actually relatively lower than the others, yet at the same time, you know, there's impact there. And then how do you quantify impact, for example? And the conversation gets very abstract to them. And then by their nature, right, um, making social impact might not be their first best of interest, which is why, you know, um, in terms of like getting the kickstart or the capital of it, Getting compliments, getting outreach, that's definitely that. People like the stories or being inspiring and all. But getting the real people, the real big guys that we need in order for us to kickstart, that's why the obstacle. I think it kind of uh, very much relate to what I mentioned just now. But an another note is that since, you know, uh, one of the biggest obstacles as well, currently even facing, right, is that um, we are in a hardware tech um, kind of scenario. Not just social impact, but we are developing a hardware tech using like solar energy, for example. And... Um, what I realized is that, um, unfortunately, in Malaysia, perhaps the accessibility to this expertise, especially hardware tech or technology that's not as, you know, as, um, as well known uh, as the other kind of tech, um, the kind of expertise available is very limited. Um, I tried to go into, you know, whether it's university or whether it's companies, um, because of how niche it is, um, it is hardly for you to access the real expertise that you need. They can give you some advice. But in depth, developing it is not really there. Um, you, the only thing they advise you is that they look overseas. And yet, you know, recently I also saw, you know, people are publishing paper like from MIT or from one of the universities in China. They have published a paper on the research which is very similar to the concept that I'm doing. And they have way more resources and way more activities to do it. So, you know, kind of, kind of like, you know, a little bit discouraging in that sense, but, you know, that's the situation that we're in now. That's, it's, that's the, the reality. The reality, the reality. exactly. That's and the real. question now is that how do we make full use of what we have and move forward from it uh, rather than just complaining about it? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I like, that's the right attitude to have. Let's see mm. what workarounds we can do. Uh, because yes. it's very easy to get ourselves sucked into a complaining and whinging environment. Uh, Muihan, mm. back to you, Muihan. Cool. So um, I have a few questions on there, but maybe before I just jump into it, uh, do you want to maybe take this opportunity to check anything with us or as well as yes. with the audiences? Uh, we got a very knowledgeable bunch of audience <laughs> help, uh, to bring some of this uh, discussion into something more interesting rather than yep. we keep asking you questions, right? Yeah, I think I think one of the biggest question I have, right, especially knowing like the audience that you guys have, right, I think this question is something very important to me and important to the third sector in a way. Um, so since things like you know COVID nineteen is happening, you know unemployment is everywhere, and a lot of companies are actually suffering, and that kind of also heavily affecting the third sector, whether it's NGO, NPO, or social enterprises, because a lot of people um claim that you know this sector is a very much of a trickle down economics, meaning that 
you know, if the main economics, like a business making uh, in general is really prospering, then they will have certain amount to be donated or to be channeled to social impact scene. Um, so I think asking this question very much on the perspective of social enterprise, meaning that are we really a trickle down economics, meaning that are we at the mercy of the main um, economic as a whole, uh, I mean market as a whole. And you know, if whether we are trickle down economics or not, and you know, what's the way forward and how, how, do, how should we view this as a whole? Lah? Yeah, and also how the companies are viewing this, whether you know, on the CSR or whether you know, they do want social impact in their scene. Okay, so if you didn't get that, maybe I will just paraphrase a bit uh, so that I also yeah. get the audience to chip in before I, I give my inputs. So Shai is trying to understand because of COVID-19 and there's a slowdown in the economy, uh, pending recession or recession, whichever you, you subscribe to, uh, how is then uh, things like the social enterprise the NGOs are being impacted because uh, mainly if they are looking uh, based on uh, donation purposes or based on uh, as a result of the, the, the market commercial economy. Uh, so he is trying to understand whether it is still a good time to stay inside this third sector or better get out, you know, uh, wait for the good times are back. Huh? So that's that's what you're trying to ask, right? Yeah, uh, just to add a very quick point, right, is that um, is it that now because COVID-19 happened, the sentiment is stronger that people are more willing to donate? Or is it like more of the other way, meaning that the purchasing power is a lot lower now and no one is really willing to provide for this seed? Yeah, cool. just a little bit more context on that, yeah. So I think I think in my perspective, uh, and I know your work, I've been following your work for some time, uh, I think you come from a sector or you come from a, a niche area which is something more refreshing in nature. Uh, if you ask me, the traditional NGOs may suffer tremendously. And I know quite a few during the last few months uh, who literally work them, their revenue, uh, quote unquote, revenue model based on donations. Uh, it is very, very significant drop. You know, uh, you can see that because generally that that's a big, big impact to that. But I think uh, just like normal commercial business, I would say that uh, difficult times or challenging times are the ones that help us to think differently. And I think for social enterprises, it's also a time for you to reinvent your business model and, and revenue model. And, and uh, if you look at it in Malaysia itself, yeah, there are few people that is uh, or the few parties that's working very well uh, pivoting into a scene where they, they can still be sustainable. Like. So mm -hmm. uh, very, very much deals to your your business model. That's one. Uh, number two is also getting the, the, the courage to really go and try it out. Like. So and I think youth is good because you can just go out there and try everything and it nothing work. to lose, right? <laughs> <laughs> so with that also I try to get uh audience to also share some ideas if you have uh, for trying on that perspective. Uh, as well as uh also let's uh take some questions or some uh so I think there's uh, one question of uh maybe from Dr. Heng to ask actually. Uh, you have any advice given for those uh, who want to do social enterprise as a career since you are in it? Yeah, I think in general, right, let's not talk about youth in social enterprise, social enterprise as a whole for any age, right? Um, to be honest, currently the trend is really growing very well for social enterprise, meaning the tractions and whether people are aware of it is growing. Um, Malaysia is very much growing in this sense. For example, we have Magic who recently just launched the um, accreditation for social enterprise, meaning that before this, right, um, it's either you register as company or register as ROS NGO. But now there's a way for you to, on a platform to register, to know yourself as a social enterprise. And there's three levels of it. So in a way, right, um, what kind of um, kickstart that you should go for social entrepreneurship is that um, I believe that the kind of awareness and the kind of focus is very much growing very quick in this scene. And for us to be in this scene now, um, I think it's really encouraging. At the same time, because of what COVID-19 um, has caused to us, right? A lot of people realize, um, if you look on the ground, other than NGO, a lot of social enterprises are running their business sustainably or even pivoted in a way um, to actually make an impact while at the same time able to generate revenue. And those kind of models are very, very inspiring. And those are the really huge success stories that people are tapping into. A lot of people want to hear more stories about this, which is why in that sense, yes, social entrepreneurship is a very great idea to kickstart right now. Um, how do we start it? 
there's a lot of resources online um even with magic they're heavily pushing for social innovation as a whole uh, many individuals many organizations are actually pushing for it um the only thing i do have to emphasize on is that getting traction again um getting people to notice it is definitely there but in terms of get, getting capital in that's definitely a question that we really need to ask because you know impact investing is not something very common here meaning that they invest in you they look at how much the social impact return um you're competing with startup which could be disruptive which churn a lot of roi very soft uh, like you know software based uh, technology and you're competing with them on the same scene uh, in that matter yes it could be challenging but if you do have a very good model and it's proven in a way um definitely there's a huge potential in that we have a lot of great social enterprises in malaysia like epic like pitch aids and so on yeah so yes so, very much agree so yeah so that that begs us to the next question and i'm cognizant of time here mm -hmm. uh, the area and you may want to raise this up from zorab chong um, Muihan, where he talks about the type of core capabilities that are required mm -hmm. uh, so give me two or three capabilities that are required to drive something like this in your mm -hmm. mind yep the first one i know is you know as typical as it sounds right passion is very much needed but i'm not talking about just passion in anything but passion in social impact in the communities that you serve because realize this is that running a social enterprise is like running two different entity at one end you have to run your business you know how do i generate sustainability financially and all these things as a business at the other end is like an ngo that you need to uh, garner more social impact in this in so how do you balance this both like how do i make more money or do i make more impact uh, and how do i balance it and how do i sustain these two entities as one um i think that's where passion it needs a, a lot more than you know um somewhat like the typical startup that you go for that's why the first thing i think very much is the passion um the second one i think is that um the core capability is about collaboration in startup scene there's a lot of people um in startup in general they can try to like dominate the market and so on but in social impact scene it's almost impossible for you to dominate dominate the social impact for example it's always running on a model of collaborate how do we collaborate to tap into more communities and how do we get sustainability together i know that you know in startup collaboration is still very much needed rather than try, trying to dominate but in the social impact social enterprising it's a lot more than that there's a lot more you need to consider do you understand the underserved community is enough do you serve each other's uh, interests well enough you know do you make financial sustainability that's why collaboration is a huge 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 core element in social Got enterprise you. Got it. Yeah. And, and that's absolutely brilliant. Um, now, we are we are really coming into the end of the program. Oh, yeah. uh, Muihan, <laughs> back great, to you. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so uh, thank you, Shai. Uh, don't go off us. Um, <laughs> you in a short while. Uh, let us do some logistics uh, while we wait back room for a while. OK, so we should don't don't lock off us. All right. So just be back. OK, so it was a very good uh, sharing. And I think uh, we have a lot, a lot of interest. Uh, maybe I will quickly just want to acknowledge a few comments. Uh, one is from, I think, uh, Lian here. I think Lian say. Uh, so she is very impressed with how uh, Shai is managing the stakeholders, finding funding. And uh, so thank you for tuning in, all right? Uh, as well as uh, we have Ted who say that uh, they have worked with the uh, RST communities in Papa. Creating awareness is important, and that's quite amazing. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, let me just see whether I miss out anyone. Yeah, uh, Ranjit. Yeah, hi. Thank you for tuning in again. All right, all right. So uh, good to hear you and the younger generation uh, will be able to use that experience in different fields. Yes. So and the last one I wanted to say was uh, from Zorab. I think so. Zorab made a good point to say that uh, for many who have not stepped into the oral IC communities. Uh, not work with them before the perception is not ready uh, maybe from experience uh, are they a lot are they ready or not uh, so maybe i'll get shy to answer that when we come back on later all right quickly uh Taranjit, what are the three things that you thought we could learn from today's uh, sure, discussion sure. with shy sure and i think the uh, the first thing is the desire to want to do the right thing for the right reasons um and to uh, the point that so that's the first one the second one is the point around social impact investment. I think the need is always there. Uh, we provide loads of funding for CSR work, and there's nothing wrong with that. But to be fair, the returns on something like that may be a lot more limiting. It becomes a dollar out more than a return to make the dollar work for other projects. So social impact financing can be an alternate. 
uh, for some of these larger organizations that have funds set aside for that. The third one that comes across is some very good questions that have been raised by the audience around how can we now leverage off these skills for other things as well. And I think Ranjit made that point around, you know, can I now utilize this for other areas? And I think, I honestly believe, yes, you can. And you rightly pointed out the other day, Muyan, where these are skills that we are picking up, not just for today, but also for tomorrow as well. So th those are some of the, the key, key takeaways. And, and I think the fact that uh, Shai has started this uh, very, uh, very early on in his career leaves a lot of room, or they, we call it a runway. There's a, there's a massive runway ahead of him for him to, uh, to, to, to experiment uh, in this regard. Wehan? Okay, so I wanted to just do a quick uh, brief on uh, who are we hosting tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow we have another young professional uh, by the name of Felicia Matthew. Uh, Tarajit, maybe a quick introduction of Felicia. Absolutely, absolutely. So Felicia comes to us with uh, almost two years worth of experience in, the, uh, in one of the big consulting firms. Uh, she's a graduate in uh, in finance and accounting from uh, uh, Taylor's University, which is great. Um, and 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 we had, if you remember, uh, Dr. Benita, who was recently on on board, uh, and she was the dean of the uh, business school out at Taylor's, which is great. Uh, and what will be very intriguing is to hear what Felicia's viewpoint is. Um, a very different sector versus the other two that we've heard today as well as yesterday, but still people who are in the uh, employment side uh, who are very relatively young, a year and a half, two years, 18 months. It'll be very intriguing to hear what she has to say uh, and the type of opportunities that have been created or not, as the case may be, given what we're currently experiencing. So do stay tuned for that. Muyan? Okay, cool. So thank you once again. Uh, let me bring Shai back on. Uh, so, uh, Shai, got one question for you from Zorab. So, uh, I think very quickly just to show you. Uh, so, he's talking about, um, sorry, technical. Uh, so, he's talking about uh, how, based on your experience and your interaction with the Orang Asli community, are they still very laid back or they are already more progressive in nature? Yep, I think that's a very great question. And the first thing we have to acknowledge is that every single um, village like Oran Asli village has a different situation. Um, not just about the culture, you know, what they practice is heavily different, different states, different villages, but the condition they're living is very different. So for example, let's say in Pahang alone, you have villages, Oran Asli villages, right, where their houses are pretty well built and then they have pipes for water and they have um, grids for electricity. Um, perhaps there's disruption happens quite often, but they do have those access and they have cars and motors to drive around. But you have situations where Orang Asi villages where it's very um, far in that you need to take like a sampan trip. Sometimes it takes up to four hours. Sometimes it takes to maybe one hour. And you know, those areas where they have no electricity at all and no access to clean water. So first thing I have to acknowledge is that it's very different. And whether you know they are ready or not, it really depends on what you're trying to do and then whether you know there's a need for it or not. So one of the things that we talk a lot in companies and so on is change management. Very much people say we need change management to increase efficiency and all. But change management is very much needed in these uh, villages as well. So some of them, maybe they just need a little bit more push for you to adapt to the you know, projects and the technology that you bring in. So really, really depends. Some areas, yes, some areas, no. And you need to evaluate it. You need to run needs assessment for it to um, happen. So yeah, uh, do acknowledge that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cool. So thank you for taking that. Uh, and I think uh, that, that wraps up our show. Uh, thank you once again for everybody who tuned in. Thank you, Shai, for agreeing to come on thank board. Thank you for having me. <laughs> presence. Uh, so, uh, so see everybody tomorrow, Friday uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, where we have another session. So for those uh, Muslim friends who are breaking their fast, Salamat the Buka Kwasa. And for those uh, going to celebrate, uh, and they're going to celebrate Hari Raya soon, uh, that just that like, can't go back compound this round huh? oh, or please don't go back. stay oh. within your state all right so with that thank you very much see you bye right good one bye bye